this here. And I go into my uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see my screen. Give me a thumbs up, Dan. Okay, cool. I really appreciate the opportunity always, of course, to talk about superheroes and, and comics. Um, as Daniel pointed out, I'm a professor in the Department of English. My background is in history. My degree is in history, but comics um, bring people together and people into different departments. So I'm really happy for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the idea of science in, in superhero comics as, as a, in particular as an outgrowth of some broader set of like social techno-culture narratives, right? Um, and I think it's always important to recognize that comic books in the United States are part of a longer tradition of science society and, and fictive world where the broader public becomes to understand and sometimes negotiate questions related to transformations and anxieties connected to technology and connected to science. And so one of the things that I, I sometimes talk to students about is that we can think about a lot of modern literature, especially something like Frankenstein, which is a sort of the modern Prometheus. This is one of the early uh, sort of science fiction stories. And here, what it's doing is tapping into at the time was with transformative knowledge related to the body, health and science and the anxiety that that was creating. If you think about the story of Frankenstein, um, it's important to recognize perhaps that the scientist Frankenstein is the monster in the story and his creation is a cautionary tale about the nature and power uh, being unleashed by scientific advancements that perhaps outstrip of uh, the sort of social and political capacities of a society. So the challenge of science almost from the very beginning, um, when we think about sort of like the modern age is this sort of disruptive uh, effect. Yes, there are lots of positives and we often as a society embrace the positives, but it doesn't take very much for us to sort of recognize that perhaps these technical innovations that we're experiencing are also creating problems. And that sense of the problems associated with science are have definite ebbs and flows. You can make an argument that our contemporary narrative around uh, digital technology and its, its social implication, read social media, are an important example of the way that science narratives uh, are in the public mind, but we might not necessarily think about them in that same way. Um, this idea that science is a place where where things can be worked out, I think is important in the context of the creation of the modern sort of comic book, because one of the things that I've sort of talked about in my research is that the comic book and comic book characters and the superhero in particular are a kind of byproduct of a proce process of modernization. And in particular, that modernization concern is connected to urbanization and modernization and related to the sort of social transformation coming in the modern city and the industrialization and the, and the nature of society disrupted by those things. And so one way we can think about this is that there's a new context at the close of the 19th century that we know well as historians, but it's, I think at some level difficult for us to sort of like grasp the shock necessarily associated with technological innovation at the close of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And this picture of the telephone lines over New York City in 18... 80, make you make, remember if you're a 201880, you've seen a tremendous amount of transformation in terms of technical um, innovation, and that will continue really apace well into the 20th century. So that you could have been born in like 1880, and by the time you get to your death, say you live to be 50 years old, think about all the changes you would have seen in that period of time. And this kind of massive transformation, not surprisingly, creates a lot of anxiety. And so when we think about comic books, when we think about popular media, often this is the place where some of these questions about technology and some of our, our anxieties, but also some of our aspirations related to the transfer of the power of technology um, plays itself out. And science is an, an incredibly important part here. I'm saying science and I'm saying technology, and, and then and I have to clarify that I think in, in for the public, sort of science and technology are, are the same thing. Whereas uh, 
we might want to quibble about well science is sort of, uh, sort of like knowledge based around you know, principles of how how the world operates and uh, understanding structures and relationships in, in, in a sort of systematic way. Technologies are tools that are being created using some of that knowledge. But in, in, the, minds of, in the minds of the public, science and technology transformations are tightly wound together. And the knowledge that people have that are scientists and the technologies they are creating increasingly become a, a point of, of tension as they outstrip what the average person understands about the nature of how the world operates. And one way to think about this is that, again, if you're living through this early period in the, in the, in the 20th century, increasingly the tools that you're using, you do not understand how they work, unless you have some sort of technical background, unless you understand the science. For a lot of people, it's just increasingly beyond them. And we, have that similar kind of feeling today, but perhaps not as pronounced all the time. Um, this, of course, plays itself out in a variety of fields, but again, I, I tend to put a lot of emphasis on um, the sort of rapid transformations in this early part of uh, uh, the 20th century around, uh, around things like war, we, we see it with weapons, we see it with innovations. And, and again, this is a lingering space where some of the anxieties associated with, with industrialization urbanization and, and the, the rise of, of, of a more technological society become part and parcel of, of some of the questions that we pose to ourselves as society uh, in, this, in this sort of pivotal moment. So why do I, I say all that and then start talking about comics? Well, one of the things about comics that I think it makes them very, very um, interesting is that they are a, a, a genre that encapsulates a lot of the fictive media that is popular, that is dealing with some of these anxieties. And, and the heroes and stories and the content and comics are really a great roadmap to understand some of this, this emphasis on technological innovation, some of our anxieties around science in the modern period. And we can see this almost from the very beginning and, and superheroes in particular have a very strong science fiction connection, right? It's a genre that we associate with the emergence uh, in the late 30s in New York City. Uh, and, and there's no question, the character that defines this is Superman. Um, I often like to point out to students that uh, Superman as a character, when you see the, the cover of Action Comics number one, which is from National Publications, which is a company that we, we, we now know as, as DC Comics, when people saw that cover in, in National Comics number one, um, that was really something they had never seen before. Uh, there are some, 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 some accounts where the editors at National Publications saw it and thought, well, this is ridiculous. No one's going to believe this. And in fact, the Action Comics anthology, and it is an anthology comic, meaning there are multiple stories in the anthology, they put Superman on the cover of Action Comics number one, but he doesn't appear on the cover again until number seven. And the reason was is that they didn't necessarily, on the surface, think that this is going to be the huge breakout character uh, from this publication. But by the time they got to the third issue, they were like, issue number one, it's on like hotcakes and it's Superman. And by the time they get to issue number seven, Superman's on the cover again. And he really never leaves the cover of Action Comics ever again. And this is no, without question, a, a, a science fiction character. Um, Joe Siegel. And Jerry Schuster, no, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, <laughs> Siegel and Schuster, um, the two young creators that created Superman initially are huge sci-fi fans, right? And their initial introduction of Superman is not the hero that you know. It's actually uh, in a short story that if you actually ever find a copy of, it's incredibly rare and incredibly valuable called The Reign of the Superman. And The Reign of the Superman sort of talks about a minimal, mentally empowered villain that will is trying to dominate the world, uh, as is the way of many sort of like writers and creatives. They rework this idea and it becomes Superman. But the, the young uh, Jerry Siegel is a huge sci-fi fan, as, as well as Joe Schuster. They're reading science fiction magazine and are very active in 
sci-fi, uh, science fiction, fanzine culture, and they're trading stories back and forth, and I'm borrowing very heavily from the plethora of speculative fiction that is sort of dominating the world in the 1930s. And of course, this is a space of real innovative thinkers. Think of groups like the Futurists out of New York, the Futurians out of New York. They're using science fiction to really sort of press and get us to think about how society could be different. And a lot of the speculative work in the 1920s, 1930s really is imagining the rapid transformation that had been the sort of norm by the, in the latter part of the 19th century continuing on and accelerating so that America, so that people on earth will live on the moon by the 1950s, live on Mars by the 1990s and be even farther out in the world uh, after that. And so there's an assumption of like a sort of scientific innovation and that we as a, a society will benefit from that. And so the science fiction origins in, in Superman are, are, are not that shocking. In fact, when we look at a lot of the pulp stories, that is the pulp adventure stories that appeared right before the superhero, many of the writers that are going to superhero comics, as I say, just like Siegel and Schuster, are, are writing sort of sci-fi stories. They're also writing other kinds of stories. There's no question about it. Pirate, cowboy, so on and so forth. But the science fiction story actually gets, I think, a lot of purchase in part because it pushes beyond the boundaries of the social landscape of the time and offers a positive spin on the, of the possibilities of the future in a world, especially in the American context, that is deeply entrenched in um, the Great Depression. And so the speculative work that we see in these pages imagines a much more sophisticated set of systems that are run by technocrats that are able to sort of deliver on things. This really is a, a period where science is supposed to be solving problems. And when you read these early comics of the 1930s and 1940s, Superman really starts a phenomenon of a comic explosion. More than 100 million people are reading comics every year in the 1940s. We call it the golden age. And it, that is true. The numbers are hard to pin down, but for somewhere between 80 and a million, 100 million comics are, are being circulated in these years. And there's often science-based heroes and science at the core of these stories. And the classic Golden Age Flash, Jay Garrick, he gets his power by inhaling heavy water. Again, a reference to um, the science of radioactivity, which people don't quite know, but will loom very large very quickly as we get drawn into the World War II. But there are all those sort of technical devices and, and uses uh, of gadgets that are important to the adventure stories of this period. And we take this uh, on face value, but remember these are in fact serious, serious science fiction kinds of tales, right? The technological innovation associated with these things are key to their success and the adventures that they fuel are, are, are engaging for the audience. Almost from the very beginning, the science villain is there. Uh, this is one of the things that makes um, the, the idea of, of science problematic. Uh, remember, one of, the, one of the things I pointed out is that as we go further and further into this, into the modern era in the 20th century, the science gets farther and farther away from the average person. So a scientist who is, who is up to no good is quite the danger. And really what personifies this idea is Lex Luthor right, uh, uh, makes his first appearance uh, in the 1940s in Action Comics number 23. Luther is not the Luther that we know, the bald-headed scientist, I, for some reason, I don't know that I, I agree with this, but the bald head is somehow associated with evil. But there is no reason to believe that, I, trust me. But the, the, the idea of, of Luther uh, that you might know from comics and television and, and movies uh, in the modern era, that is not how the, first, the character is first introduced. He's got a full head of red hair. Uh, super geeky points if you know the story of how he lost his hair, which I, I will cover in Q&A if someone asks me, how did he, how did he lose his hair? Or one version of how he lost his hair. Um, but the scientist villain is a mainstay very early in the golden age, right? Because these are people who know something that the average person doesn't know. If they have a poor moral character, or if they, for instance, lose their humanity, again, an idea that we might trace back to Frankenstein. 
then they could in fact be very dangerous people. And the idea of the mad scientist, the super evil genius, the criminal mastermind, all these are people who are more um, cognitive and less heart, which is a, a kind of critique that for many Americans rings very true that these are people who might have a lot of book learning, but they lack moral certainty and moral clarity. That's a, a particular way of reading technical innovation, but it's something that we can trace back through uh, some of the earlier works that weren't comic books like um, the Pulp Adventures stories. The emphasis on a strong body and a sharp mind uh, as personified by action heroes that are, tended to be white, hetero, heterosexual males um, is often pitted against a weaker but devious, often othered body, right? So they might be Asian, sort of feeding into a longstanding uh, anti-Asian bias in the American context, or they might be um, Jewish, again, um, feeding into a longstanding and Semitic strand in the American context. And so you can see some troubling overlaps between sort of established uh, um, marginalized ideas related to ethnic others who are not sort of white Anglo-Saxon being overlaid with this idea that like, these people have access to knowledge or are using their, their, their quote unquote brain power uh, in devious and dangerous ways. And so um, characters like Professor Skin who, who might, might you know, hint at some elements of Asianness or some, a character like in the super brain who might be a sort of Eastern European in, in facial construction. These all really sort of like speak to this, this feeling of like too much book learning could be very dangerous to you, um, which is actually, uh, again, a very complicated set of ideas around fitness and, and a kind of really complicated at the time race science of the early 20th century that thankfully um, will be, be made not acceptable by World War II because the other people in, the, in this era who really embrace eugenics are the Nazis, and we all agree Nazis are bad people, right? But the ideas, right, the idea of this sort of devious mind is, is dangerous are really important for us to, to, to think about. As we move forward in time, um, the implications of the 1940s, of course, superhero stories are going to parallel at some level the war effort. We'll have lots of imagery um, showing characters like Superman advocating for, for Americans to buy war bonds, but the pages of the comic book, they very rarely engage in, in the war directly. It was seen as being disrespectful for the actual American soldiers who are fighting in the war. But the war does come to an end and it comes to an end in the Pacific in the devastating explosion in Hiroshima. And the consequences of that really do feed into this strand of like science as a danger. And you can see it sort of playing itself out in popular culture and it plays itself out in comics too. Um, we can think about some of the pop culture landscape of the post-war, post-World War II period, the late 40s and early and, and 50s and see a real concern about the impact of the atomic age. A uh, Godzilla is a prime example of this. I'm sure all of us have seen some version at, at some point in our lives of a Godzilla film. But think of that as from the Japanese perspective, the devastating effect of radiation on, on, on bodies and land in their perspective. From our perspective, we can see uh, at some level an increasing concern about atomic energy getting out of control, atomic energy creating monsters. And the people responsible for that, again, of course, were scientists, but not the scientists of the previous, previous time that are, are twinge with questions of um, sort of racial othering, these are more middle of the road scientists that like the, the, that previous generation also had questions about their morality that needed to be addressed, right? So the, the, there's a twin sort of impulse coming out of the post-war period. The United States is an incredibly important power. It is leading the free world. We're very rapidly getting involved in the Cold War. Science is very important in that process, but managing the consequences of the atomic age are incredibly important. This becomes even more so, remember that at the end of the war, the United States is the only country with the atomic bomb, but very quickly, 
um, Russia gets the atomic bomb. And so then this is this question of like, are we going to be able to stay ahead of our enemies related to science and the anxiety about how atomic energy might get out of control are twin narratives that we're always thinking about. In, in comics, uh, the, the sort of post-war period, the silver, the silver age of comics is, really starts in the late 1950s and is really closely associated with the emergence of Marvel Comics. This is a place where the scientist at some level gets a major rehabilitation in the context of this Cold War narrative. I remember I say that like, you know, earlier we can see lots of examples of really dangerous super geniuses and evil sciences. In the pages of Marvel Comics, in the context of the Cold War, there's no question that the scientist gets rehabilitated. And it has a lot to do with that space race and the sort of weapons technology question in the Cold War. Most people will remember uh, the Fantastic Four is the first family of Marvel. They were the first big hit of Marvel in, in 1961. Um, but what most people forget is why did they get in that rocket? Why did they get in the rocket with that, 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 that crashes? Would they get exposed to radiation? They were trying to beat the Russians to the moon. That was why they did it. And they were, and Reed Richards, the leader, is rushing because he knows that there is a Russian counterpart. And he, he, he goes before he should, really. Like, you know, he made a mistake. They get exposed to radiation and they become the Fantastic Four. Again, some elements here worth noting. Um, Stan Lee, who is the um, chief writer of this period at Marvel Comics, is working with uh, a host of uh, artists. Most importantly, of course, is Jack Kirby. And they are imagining a number of different concepts. The Fantastic Four is a family concept, but the head of that family is a scientist named Reed Richards. And he has a surrogate wife who will eventually become his wife and two squabbling kids, uh, the thing Ben Grimm and uh, Susan Richards' younger brother, Johnny. Uh, but they are, no, without question, science heroes. They do not have secret identities. Uh, although the first issue of the Fantastic Four, they don't have any costumes. And Stan Lee has been quoted as talking about people really were really upset about that. So they very quickly got them into costumes. But from the very beginning, they're all about the science. And Reed Richards is the world's smartest man. And they are professional scientific adventurers, an idea that Jack Kirby had played around a little bit in his work with DC, but really sharpened at some level in the pages of uh, the Fantastic Four. Uh, this little drawing you can see here of the Baxter building, their headquarters, which is actually just a giant research lab. Um, and as you can see, they save for future reference. They got all manner of labs and research. Uh, I don't know how many degrees that Reed Richards has, but he's got a lot because he, he runs everything from biological to material to, to earth sciences in this lab get up that he has in the Baxter building, which if we think about it in the context of the Cold War, where science is actually deemed an important national security concern, Made, made, made that much more clear by the passage of the 1956 Science Education Act. These are important times for Americans and for American children and Americans in general to support scientists and support science, right? Because they are in the front lines of our Cold War um, battle with the, the, the Union of Soviet Social Republic, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, Russia for short, right? Um, and this becomes an important part of how Marvel positions literally all of its heroes. In Marvel, when we look, we're seeing very much every hero, they may not necessarily have the level of sophistication as Reed Richards. I mean, he has everything. There is a gym, there's an electronics lab, I mean, everything. Um, but pretty much every hero in Marvel Comics is a science hero, if we think about it. Every hero in Marvel Comics is a scientist. And part of their ability to succeed and overcome their enemies has to do with their scientific acumen. Yes, we could read many of these stories as science fiction stories. And in fact, the company, the entity before Marvel was called Timely Comics. And many of these titles, Amazing Fantasy, Tales to Astonish, 
were science fiction titles, meaning they were anthology titles similar to uh, DC Comics um, action comics, right? Where they had multiple stories and they would have a sort of lead story or a lead character that would define it. And they have other stories in the comic. In the earlier years, before the introduction of characters like Spider-Man and the Amazing Fantasy or the Ant-Man and Tales of Astonish, these tended to be sort of monster stories or science fiction stories. Often a lot of monster stories. Marvel was huge on monster stories. And those monsters like Godzilla really sort of like spoke to this sort of concern about radiation and environmental transformation associated with radiation and so on and so forth. In the 1960s, in the context of that Cold War, all that changes. Now they're all about these heroic characters that are breaking the mold in different ways, but are always using science to do the right thing, to help America. And even the teen character who Stan Lee, uh, when he talks about the origin story of Spider-Man, he makes it very clear, Stan Lee tended not to like kid characters. They were often sidekicks in his earlier career when he was working at, at Timely Comics. And that was very common in comics in the 1930s to have kid characters as sidekicks and maybe spin off those sidekicks into their own stories. But in the context of creating Spider-Man, uh, Stan Lee creates a character in Peter Parker who's the lead, but he's very much a science meat geek, right? He's a, he's a nerd, he gets his power because he goes to a, they're on a field trip at a uh, really high tech uh, lab. He gets bitten by a radioactive spider. Again, radioactivity, instead of radioactivity being bad, which again was the concern coming out of the war, radioactivity can be good because another one of the elements of the narrative being articulated in the broader culture, a broader, broader defense oriented culture. And that's something that Marvel takes up in lots of different ways. So Spider-Man's a, science heroes able to come up with gadgets and is empowered by radioactivity and, and, and does the right things, a hero with great responsibility. Um, even Ant-Man, you know, is a really very tight transformation in terms of like this sort of like culture and, and concern about science and, and comic books and how it plays itself out. Remember, as I say, after the war, people were really concerned about radiation. There were a prefla of basically radiation inspired horror narratives, be it incredibly shrinking man or incredibly growing woman or dim, like, you know, giant ants or Godzilla, giant lizards, so on and so forth. Uh, even in Tales of Astonish, as I say earlier, you have these characters where like people are shrinking, they're being terrorized by monsters and so on and so forth. Um, Ant-Man, Henry Pym, who, you know, prior to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, probably a character not many people know, is a very well-respected scientist who is developing um, weapons and material for the government and is often fighting government uh, enemies of the United States, communist agents. And this is also, again, a recurring theme. Pym identifies a, a, a serum, tests it on himself, and becomes Ant-Man. Uh, there are lots of ways where this is like not good scientific principles. You don't test things on yourself. But in the context of a, like a broader set of like nationalistic and pro-science narratives connected to the idea of promoting and protecting the United States, this really is emblematic of a narrative that becomes very important. Even the X-Men, which again, when we think about this in, in the context of the period, the X gene is a deliberate and again, very direct reflection of the, the power of radiation. Uh, but again, instead of it being negative as it was a mere decade before, it becomes very, 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 very powerful and very important as the X-Men become a, an allegory for youth culture that is uh, fighting to do the right thing and tapping into some of these broader, broader sort of ambivalence that we have about the status quo and, and this is a title in particular, I always think is very interesting because there's a lot of technological innovation on the part of the X-Men as a group. Yes, they have powers that are inspired by radiation, but they, they have a jet, you know, the Professor X uses computers. There's a lot here that really speaks to the way that technology can be used to promote a kind of better status quo, which becomes a very important element of this story.
I don't want to ignore DC Comics in 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 this context. Uh, as I was I was saying prior to us going live, I am a Marvel kid, but when we talk about science and technology and 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 sort of um, aspirations and anxieties, I think Batman is a really important character uh, that encapsulates some of this from the sort of DC perspective. One of the things about Batman that's really interesting, of course, is that like a lot of superhero characters from this period, um, there's a lot of trauma associated with, with Superman. Um, we can think about super, uh, Batman, there's a lot of trauma associated with Batman. We can think about Superman's story as having a kind of tragedy associated with it, but he's not a personal, he doesn't have a personal connection to that tragedy. Like his planet blew up before he was you know, even aware, like he was rocking to here as a child. Batman is very different. Batman is a character whose origin story is tied up in, in violence. But Batman is very much a character who's also uh, using tools, right? Using, using technology to address the, the problems associated with that violence the, to protect other people. And this is one way we, we can think about Super um, Batman as a character. He's both a uh, in some ways, like his predecessors and publication, uh, like a Doc Savage, a, a physically fit to perfection, like, you know, trained to perfection individual with an incredibly strong body, but he's also incredibly honed mind, right? Batman is a criminologist. He is, is wealthy beyond belief, and that sort of helps him fund his um, uh, attack on crime. But it's technical innovation that really um, makes it possible. You can see this almost from the beginning in the personification of his toolkits that he uses in relation to carrying out his, his war on, on crime. Uh, very, very early on, he's always at the cutting edge, be it use, use of chemicals to create smoke screens or uh, technical innovation related to automobiles. I think in the popular imagination, uh, the car, the Batmobile, for obvious reasons, again, this is an American context, is a real driver to how we understand that narrative a lot of, in a lot of ways. Batman's uh, Batmobile changes over time and each generation gets a new sort of updated version. You can think about the, the Batmobile from the 1966 uh, television program, sorry, uh, Adam West and Burt Ward. And you think about Christopher Nolan's Tumblr, which is an urban assault vehicle sort of version of the Batmobile. Each one of them is speaking to a kind of technological uh, innovation that's uh, accessible to Batman. And he, he puts the good use in his war on crime. And, and in particular in Nolan's um, iteration, he's very clear that you know, Bruce Wayne has access to military grade technology, something that people had shied away from prior to that, but it's very much the case. Like it is technical innovation that allows him to sort of like, take this extra extra legal policing uh, perspective and, and impose order on, on, on Gotham in some level. Uh, the Batmobile is the, the sort of personification of his abilities, uh, but really most people tend to think of Batman because he doesn't kill as being someone who has a lot of tools, a lot of gadgets at his disposal. And throughout the years, um, like this, this little, little snippet, from the letter column, uh, that that fact that he doesn't kill, but he has all these tools because again, another positive narrative attached to the technical innovation of not just simply uh, Batman, but really the technical innovation of Americans writ large, which is something that I think comes through with other characters as well. Uh, if you ever curious what's on Batman's utility belt, here's a, a handy dandy little uh, visualization like a lot of things, uh, Batman is a master of miniaturization and, and computer power. This is something that in comics happens very early on. They're always very much at the cutting edge of whatever technical innovation is present in people's minds at the time. And so when you're reading comics, one of the great things about them is they're looking at the, so the most cutting edge technology and pushing a little bit further to tell their story. So. The mineralization that you see in Batman's utility belt is really a marvel of, uh, of, of sort of you know imagination. And in some ways, as is the case with a lot of these sort of like fictive narratives, if they become they start to feed into like aspirations 
that we might have in terms of real life. I always like to point out to students that the guy who invented the cell phone, when asked, where did you come up with that idea? He's like, well, I, I saw Star Trek as a kid and they had that communicator. I was like fascinated by how they did that. And this is one of the ways that I think it's important to think about comics as a space of aspiration and negotiation around the implications of technology. And Batman's utility belt is great because he's got a Marco processor recorder, you know, tear gas pellet. He's got all this stuff, but it's always so super small, right? He's wearing that around this belt and he's not a big man. So he's like, you know, cut. Um, Batman's costume also has gone through numerous technical innovations. If you recognize, this is from um, the, the most recent Ben Affleck version of Batman, uh, which now Batman suit is basically armor. In, in previous years, previous decades, Batman suit wasn't necessarily armor, but now it's just basically armor. It's a hard shell that moves with him. And that's something that, again, speaks to this use of cutting edge fibers, uh, uh, technology, you know, heads up display, so on and so forth all of which are, have some roots in real life, but are pushed to the extreme in the context of Batman. And this is actually bat armor armor as, a well, as opposed to the other kind of armor, which is a kind of flexible uh, weave. Uh, the military industrial complex, I think is an important element here. Uh, in particular, um, I can trace this as we see in Batman, but in, in Marvel comics, it's really personified by Iron Man. And so when we talk about the military industrial complex, Iron Man is the character that, that, that personifies that. The origin of the character is literally in Vietnam. It's a weapons test. The original origin, origin of Tony Stark's Iron Man is that he was in Vietnam to do a weapons test. He's a weapons manufacturer. He goes to Vietnam to do a weapons test. It goes wrong, he gets captured. And he creates his armor. His first act as a hero is to blow up a communist village, right? To, to escape from that village. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they update it to Afghanistan, but the premise is exactly the same. And that updating, of course, I think speaks to the malleability of some of these stories, but also the troubling sort of like inner, inner uh, transformation associated with like some of the pro pro-social, pro-American narratives of the 1960s being pulled forward into a kind of um, anti-terrorism narrative of the day. Uh, another example of sort of technological in innovation and, and use of science is in the spy stories of, of Marvel with Nick Fury. The original Nick Fury uses everything from robots to, to chemicals to uh, sort of like James Bond-esque kinds of tools in defense of the United States against Hydra, which are sort of like, you know, kind of fascist remnants of uh, Nazis from World War II. Uh, Fury is a, originally inspired as a sort of James Bond-ish type character, but very, very, very heavily relies on the technical expertise of Tony Stark. Tony Stark is the primary weapons uh, supplier for S.H.I.E.L.D., which is the sort of like world police organization. And he provides all manner of tools from flying cars to ray guns to all these other stuff to allow Nick Fury to do his job. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this idea of that there's a, a sort of techno culture feed in popular culture is, is what I want to sort of like start to wrap my, my, my sort of exploration of science uh, and comics in. Um, there's no question that when we started to think about, when we look, we can sort of see how some of the ideas that, that play themselves out in comic books have started to bleed into the real world. This, this um, uh, effort to try to create exoskeletons that allow soldiers to lift, run, move faster in real life uh, is a defense department project, right? It's a very real thing that is a part of a sort of like 21st century battlefield. Uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the movies that many of you probably have seen, the idea of, of science and technology as the driver of the universe is front and center. Um, that is actually something that we can trace back to comics, but not the comics that you know, actually it's a, from an imprint the, called the, um, the Ultimate Marvel Universe, which was created around 2001. And in that imprint, they really sort of just accept 
the idea that superheroes would be military actors, that they would be part of a, a super soldier program. Remember, Captain America in the original uh, Marvel Universe is a World War II era military project, right? Well, what if you just spun up the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, Marvel Universe around the idea that the military is doing this and, and superheroes are weapons of mass destruction. And this is the idea that Mark Millar and Brian Michael Bendis, who are two writers that wrote that series, sort of embraced Millar in particular because of his background um, coming from Scotland, really sort of like thought about the United States as a place where the military and, and military tools are very central and really used that idea to drive his reinterpretation of some of these classic characters. Um, S.H.I.E.L.D. is the, the, the connective tissue for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And S.H.I.E.L.D. is a you know, quasi-military, secret military operation, right? With a black ops side and you know, sort of public safety uh, concerns that rely on technology and, and weapons uh, to keep us secure. In many ways, this, this interpretation is very much influenced by the impact of 9-11. That in itself is also a technological and science-oriented um, transformation. Remember that for many Americans, it's the reliance on things like signals intelligence, meaning like you know reading people's mail, looking and you know using technical tools, um, listening are very important to our security, uh, as well as other kinds of facial recognition. Um, we have really complicated feelings about this, I think as a rule, but these ideas have long been played, played, played around in, in comics. And now they're, they're sort of like in the front when we think about some of the data adaptations of comics on the big screen. Um, Nick Fury in, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Daniel, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. And that was because in the comic book version of this, uh, the, the British artist thought who's a really cool black person who would be a military officer and he used Nick Fury, he used Samuel L. Jackson as his model for Nick Fury without his permission. Uh, and he just thought it was cool. So he didn't sue Marvel. But in film, Nick Fury, if you remember the Marvel Cinematic Universe coming together, it's this sort of connective character along with Agent Phil Coulson. And everything about this story is about science, is the explanation. Started with Iron Man, where he's building his armor, um, going through Captain America, where they flash back and go, hey, the weapons program that created Captain America, we, we, we want to keep that program up. Um, that program, that weapons program that created Captain America, they hired Bruce Banner to try to you know, succeed in that program. He failed, but he created the Hulk. Even Thor, which should not in some ways be associated with science, in that film, they explain, well, you know, your ancestors called it magic and you call it science. Well, when I come from, the, 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 those are the same things, which is really a belt reference to this idea that any you know, suitably sophisticated society, technologically sophisticated society is gonna seem like magic to a lesser sophisticated society, right? So science is at the core of all these things, even the, the remnants of that technology are incredibly important to how people see and understand um, so some of the con connective tissue of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I want to think about the idea that our continuing fascination with science and science fiction uh, that we can trace back to the 19th century, that is, that is you know, completely sort of shaped some of the ways that we, we think about our adventures in, in comic books, superhero comic book stories. And even as we move into uh, the cinematic version of those characters, that negotiation of science and the, and the implications of techno culture connected to it are important ways that we're considering some of the, some of the future benefits and some of the future dangers associated uh, with uh, the technical innovations that we pursue to keep us safe and to improve our lives and to fight our enemies. So I'm gonna stop it right there. Hopefully my ramblings made a little bit of sense and I'd be more than happy to try to answer some questions.
Thank you very much, Julian. I have about a thousand questions for you myself, but I'll <laughs> the ones we've got on Facebook and Twitter so far. And please, as we're going along, people uh, online on Twitter and Facebook, still please post your comments in the chat and we'll go through them one by one. So uh, first of all, I have a question from Amy on Twitter who asks, what sparked the golden age of comics in the first place? Do we know? All right, the golden age is a, a historical reference. It simply means the publication of Superman, which is in 1938, and goes through to um, really sort of like the early 1950s. It is the, the, the high selling era of comic books. So from like 1938 to 1950, comics are selling in the, you know, the millions on an annual basis. Comic books like Superman are selling a million copies a month. And this is part of the reason we call it the golden age. After the war is over, especially in the later 1940s, the superhero comics, their sales drop, but they're replaced by the rise in horror comics and crime comics. And this in fact is really important because those comics spark a kind of social, um, social anxiety because of, of youth culture. And if you remember Frederick Wortham, who was a, a social critic, a uh, psychiatrist and social critic who wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent, he argued that comics were bad for kids. And at the time, there was a real concern about juvenile delinquency. And in response to that, comic book publishers voluntarily uh, imposed a comic book code that severely undercut um, crime and horror comics. And so that's that's sort of how we know that the golden age of comics is over, right? It starts in 1938, and then around 1954, with the um, publication of the Seduction of the Innocent and Senate hearings on juvenile delinquency, then the creation of the Comic Code, it's over. And then we sort of have a sort of a lull till we get to the 1960s with the Silver Age. Interesting. So it was part to do with, this is my understanding where you're saying, it's part to do with Superman was something that really caught people's imagination, but maybe it was at a time where people needed something like that, that then the, this massive amount of comics start to be bought. So that's Right. So Superman starts the superhero genre, like that's the first superhero. And that really sparks an explosion of comic book public publishing and buying. And so all the characters, a lot of the characters that you know, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, they're all created, created in rapid succession after Superman. Okay, very cool. So we have a comment, um, which I'd be interested in your feedback on from Nicole on Facebook says, is interesting how these comic caricatures carry through and pervade society and affect even the way we think about scientists then and now. Do you have anything to, to say to that? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's always interesting to me, you know, about the, the idea of science and comics is that there are a lot of stereotypes here and those stereotypes are really tightly connected to uh, prevailing concerns related around technology and science. And I, and, and the sort of, the element here of like, you know, the placement of the pure scientist as, well, as opposed to the hands-on scientist is really interesting. Uh, I think one of the things that, that makes uh, Tony Stark Iron Man palpable to people as a character is that he has all the hands-on capability, right? Like he's an engineer who are scientists, but not like the sort of like theoretical scientists which in, in, a, in our kind of popular imagination, those people are detached from reality. And that, and that could be cute as in the absent-minded absent -minded scientist, or it could be sinister as in this person doesn't have humanity and they're gonna do something bad, which I would argue is one of the things that even today in the midst of a pandemic, when people are, are talked to about, um, vaccines and things like that, they do worry about how, how scientists have thought about the implications for individuals, for, you know, people, right? As opposed to like, you know, the, the raw numbers are in my favor. You know, 80 out of 100 people will survive, right? Like, you know, like, <laughs> like that's not what those numbers mean. When, people, when they say the Johnson & Johnson is 67% effective, 
that doesn't mean like the people who are not effective are going to die, right? Like, uh, but you know how science science narratives can be very twisted. Yeah, very interesting. And then how much uh, comics can do for the image and the and how people rely on scientists. That's uh, so we could have a a lot to thank from comics, especially during certain periods for for bringing our reliability up. Um, I actually, so we asked the audience if anyone wanted to uh, have a guess at how or why Lex Luthor lost his hair. But we didn't have anyone, but I, I want to see if I can try and get some geek points. I'm probably wrong, but does it have something to do with trying to do something with kryptonite to kill Batman and it made him lose his hair? Did I get close? <laughs> Killed Superman? Yeah, <laughs> with kryptonite, no? no? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, Okay, so the original story, because uh, there's a lot of retconning, right? Like there's lots of different versions of this stuff. But, but the one that's classic is that in in Superboy, which is a character that Siegel and Schuster created after Superman, which tells the story of Superman as a boy, Superboy, um, he and Lex Luthor are friends. Mm -hmm. Lex is a scientific whiz in Smallville, and Superboy is Superboy. And actually Lex helps Superboy and Superboy builds him a lab as a as 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 thanks and then Lex has an accident in his lab and Superboy comes and the lab is filled with like smoke and Superboy uses his breath to blow that toxic smoke out and Lex loses his hair right. after that and he says and he believes that that Superboy did that deliberately because he was jealous of Lex and that's becomes the basis of their like animosity. Okay. Clearly, this is a really silly Silver Age story, <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 the origin story from the original comics of like you know how did Lex Luthor lose his hair when they retconned him <laughs> into existence? No, no geek points for me then, unfortunately. There we go. Right. Well, also, I don't think that like you know you become the most evil man alive if you lose <laughs> your hair. Like, <laughs> like I just don't. I just don't believe that. <laughs> Julian, if 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 I may, if I may ask you, uh, where do you see comic or comic books in twenty years from now, with all the technological advances and the social media and everything? Well, you know, I think we're gonna have um, a lot more digital comics that are easier to to have access to and. Um, that will be probably very important for, for comics. I don't think that print comics will go away. I think more likely that uh, print comics will be a more prestige format as a norm. So less floppies, more hardcover, basically. Uh, and I think that um, for comic book readers, there's gonna be a lot more awareness of the many different genre of story that you can get in comic form. So um, we think about, for good reason, the superhero, because it's a very popular genre, but comics of every genre are published. Like if you want to read a romance comic today, you can, they do publish them. If you want to read a wrestling comic, you can, they do publish them. If you want to read like a horror science fiction story, you can, they do publish them. But the thing that you, you, it's easy for you to see and find is superhero stories. But uh, if you go to a, you know, any competent, comic book shop and say I want to do you know I, you got any mystery comics they do they, they have straight up mystery comics so you know when people ask me what comic books to read I go like what do you like to read so you say you want to read a, a Tom Clancy story I'm like well this comic's for you right <laughs> if you say you want to read a nice romance story I'm like oh, okay well think about this All right so that is what I see um, probably becoming more mainstream a broader understanding of the many, many different kinds of stories that you're reading in comic form and a lot more of um, the sort of prestige format that's similar to what you might find in Europe as Daniel was talking about before we, we came on. Thank you. So I think we have time for two more questions, maybe more. So Nancy on Facebook uh, says, I do want to know why the evil people are often depicted as bald but I'm also interested in what you said about time and how the use of technology in comics points us towards specific kinds of, of futures. 
and how you think that is operating in newer forms of the genre in the present day. And maybe linked to that or, or maybe partially separate, sorry to ask you two questions at the same time. Uh, she also asked, what relationships and anxieties do you think are at the heart of our fascination with superhero comics in relation to tech and otherwise? Right, so um, on, the, on the time issue, I think one of the things that happens in, in the comic form, because it's both a visual and a textual medium, is that the creators are often uh, using uh, the latest technology, like Iron Man is my, my, my prime example of this. When, when Iron Man was first introduced, he was a transistor empowered hero. Like his armor was powered by a transistor, which at the time were a cutting edge thing. Now Iron Man's armor is, is, is powered by, and, and over time it, it changes, right? So uh, microchips, liquid metal, uh, biological, like there was a, a, you know, he has a biological interface now, um, nanotech, right? In 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 the in the movie, in game, um, uh, Tony Stark had a bio, he had a nanotech suit, right? And 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 those things are at some level real. We can't do that with nanotech, not right? But we know what we know, nano filaments and things like that. And so a lot of times when you're reading, a lot of writers who write comic books are, are huge science fans. Jack Kirby was a huge science fan and he would read popular mechanics and popular science and, and, and take some of those concepts and integrate them into his, in his art. And so there's a lot of um, sort of like trying to be on the bleeding edge that is in the storytelling framework of where are essentially, you know, you know monthly science fiction tales, right? So they're they're trying to stay ahead, right? They gotta be interesting enough, but they also have to be referential enough, right? So um, in Star Trek, everything has a science um, sort of like solution, even if you, even if the science is not real. And, and in a similar way, comic books are like that too, that they're, they're in negotiation and, 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 and in dialogue with the possibilities we associate with technology and science. Um, and so that's one of the things that's that's there. With the superhero, part of the part of the, the the challenge for us is that because we have this sort of technologically advanced society, what guarantees do we have that good things will happen? What guarantees do we have that um, the society that has access to this technology is going to do the right thing? I mean, you can think about this in the context of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they, you know, and in, in the comics too, they've had storylines where people will talk about sort of individual liberty, individual authority versus sort of like centralized control, right? So who should be in charge of the powers of these people? Uh, in, in, in comics, they had a storyline called Civil War, which they interpreted in a much more, you know, limited way in the movies. And you can see in that, in that film, there's an element there where Captain America is going like, you know, I should be in control. I, at the end of the day, you know, I trust me to do the right thing. And we trust him too, cause he's Captain America, right? Like he's a very noble person, but in reality, we as a society often do look towards a centralized authority to try to regulate and create a, a even playing field to make sure that the average person is not abused too much by technology not abused too much by uh, science and and how much of that we need versus the need for freedom to innovate are very very real questions for Americans they're, they're, they're real questions globally but they're very strong questions for Americans because we have this sort of uh, cultural narrative around like freedom and independence and ability to innovate and not over regulating versus well, I think a lot of people would agree. They can point to places where like, well, this business has gone too far or not gone far enough in terms of the responsibilities to its customers, right? It's, it's interesting. Um, I've never really thought about it like that before, but then kind of, yeah, and I understand from Nancy's question and that, that it's kind of the comics are tapping into real things that people are worried about or thinking about and putting them in a form where it's fantasy, but it's still kind of addressing those questions through the stories that they tell. Right. Right. It's really interesting. And, and I think we, we can recognize 
uh, perhaps not, you know, there might be, there might not be one-on-one. And of course they can't be because their job is to sell. So they don't want to put people off, right? The thing about a lot of these stories, these allegory stories is like, if you on one side or the other, you, you can often see yourself, right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. No, 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 I kind of agree with that. Whereas if it was in real life, you would, you know, almost be triggered to be like, no, right? But in a superhero story, if, if Batman is fighting Superman, uh, and you can think of them as there's this person who really believes in like the status quo and this other person who's really suspicious about the status quo and you can go well yeah they both got good points but you wouldn't necessarily do that if they were senators interesting so uh, we have a question just popped up from Burton as well who says I'd love to hear your take on the Watchmen and its significance to the comic history sometime. It could be a whole session unto itself, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. You yeah. were, Watchmen like, is the greatest, one of the greatest novels written in the 20th century. We're going to have to have you back Alan to talk about Watchmen another time, and then we'll be sure to, to get that out. <laughs> I guess one, one last question just to close, um, and this is a question from uh, Leas and I. Uh, is if you don't mind us asking who is your favorite superhero then yeah you know my favorite superhero since i was a kid has been like iron man right tony stark iron man that's always been one of my favorites uh, probably a second favorite is black panther but yeah iron man has always been like so sort of like my favorite favorite character i'm a big avengers fan right uh yeah, actually, that does that link into another question from jack actually which we'll just slip in this question from Twitter, uh, who said, uh, who asked, did, did team ups like the, the ones that the Avengers that happen in the movies today, did those happen in the earliest comics as well? Or was it separate? No, those, those happened very early in comics. Um, the Justice Society of America was a DC comic, or the Seven Soldiers of Victory was a DC comic, brought together individual heroes in, in team comics, right? Like joint adventures. And that's very, that was very common. Um, it's a way for you to get characters, all the characters that people love in one place, but it's also a way for you to introduce a character and then spin them off into their own book, right? So like someone might, you know, get introduced in the Avengers and be like, oh, let's do a miniseries with that character, right? Like, yeah, how the popularity takes off. And right, that. exactly. Very cool. Okay, well, I think we have to leave it there. there are lots of questions. Thank you to the audience. And uh, so a huge thank you to Julian for joining us. It was uh, fascinating and uh, obviously sparked our imagination. Hopefully people will go off and read lots of their old comics if they can dig them up, for, maybe find an issue number one Superman. If you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah, if you do that, <laughs> wow, you are really lucky. And uh, we're going to have to have you come back now and give us a talk about Watchmen as well. I'm sure that would be equally enthralling. I want to also to take a quick chance to thank uh, Leas as well, who you heard asking questions there, who's doing all the social media for these events. So obviously without that, uh, these things couldn't work. And to the audience at home, thank you for joining in and asking all the great questions. Please follow us on social media and then you can hear about the next talks like this exciting one coming up in the future. So thank you again, Julian, really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, it. thank you so um, much. Thank you very much, Julian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.